Hi, I'm Catherine from Crime Psych. In this video, I'm going to be giving a psychological analysis of Ian Huntley. Ian Huntley killed two 10-year-old girls named Holly Wells and Jessica Chapman on the 4th of August in Soham in the UK in 2002. This crime enraged the nation as Huntley was working as a caretaker in the schools that the, that the girls attended and his girlfriend had been the girls' teaching assistant. Holly and Jessica had both been at a barbecue at Holly's home and the pair had left the house about six o'clock to go and buy some sweets from the local shop. On their way back, they walked past Ian Huntley's house. Huntley came out and asked the pair to come in to the house and he told them that his girlfriend Maxine Carr was inside the house. The girls did go inside the house as they had no reason at all to fear him. He was the caretaker at their school and his girlfriend had been their teaching assistant. And this was the last time that Holly and Jessica were seen. The parents reported Holly and Jessica missing at about 9.45 that evening. The police then began to search for them and a photograph of them both was released. The police also reconstructed the last known movements of the girls and videoed it using actress actresses and this was released to the public a few days later. The police received several pieces of information from members of the public, however this didn't result in any significant lines of inquiry. The police were aware that Ian Huntley was one of the last people to see Holly and Jessica and he said that he'd spoken to them on the doorstep and that they'd walked off. He also gave interviews with the press and so did his girlfriend Maxine. He acknowledged that he was most likely the last one to talk to them. They were questioned by the police, however Maxine had said that they were together that night when the girls went missing and therefore Ian Huntley was released. He came across as a fairly quiet man who had quite a small unassuming frame. There was nothing about his appearance or the way that he spoke to suggest that he might have been involved in the girls disappearance. He came across as a fairly quiet and gentle man who was quite withdrawn. However, he did conceal his violent and controlling nature incredibly well. He acted in such a way that he was very non-threatening to the general public and people who we met. However, behind closed doors, we know that he was extremely violent, controlling and manipulative. Ian Huntley was obviously very manipulative. He clearly put a lot of thought and effort into acting in a way that he wanted to be seen in public. Maxine, as I said, also did talk to the press and it was in this interview that suspicion began to arise. When she spoke about Holly and Jessica, she spoke about them in their past tense. She said things like she was lovely. The police also picked up on the use of language and two weeks after the girls had gone missing, Maxine and Ian were brought in for questioning and their house was then searched. And this is when evidence was found at the pair's home and the police realised that the girls were most likely dead at this point. They found the clothes that matched the description of what Holly and Jessica were wearing at Huntley's home. And this is fairly common. Unfortunately, when somebody kills, they keep trophy items belonging to the victim. It's thought that the killers use these trophies to help to relive details of the event. Around two weeks after the bodies had gone missing, the girls were found in a ditch about 12 miles away. An inquest found that they had not been killed at that location, uh, but they were murdered elsewhere and then transported to that site. The site at which the bodies are taken can have significant meaning to the offender. They'll choose a location which is far enough away from their home so that they're unlikely to be caught. However, this location will need to be within a suitable travelling distance. Ian Huntley is likely to have known the area that he put the bodies in because he will have chosen somewhere which is quite quiet. It's likely to be a place where the bodies the bodies would have been placed in a place where passers-by would not easily have come across them. 
When the police charged Ian Huntley with the murders, he was presented with indisputable evidence. Huntley had then dribbled during the police interview and refused to answer any further questions, which led him to being sectioned and assessed for mental illnesses. However, this was simply an attempt to avoid being held accountable. A former girlfriend of his had come forward and said that we, when they were dating together, he would often feign mental illness during the 1990s when he came to the attention of the police over various allegations that were made against him. This wasn't the first time that Ian Huntley had been under investigation by the police. Ian Huntley had been accused and investigated of several, on several occasions for burglary, underage sex and rape. He had a very unhealthy interest in young girls and women. A 15-year-old girl had alleged that they'd had sex, but that she didn't want to prosecute. He was also accused of indecently assaulting an 11-year-old girl. He was never charged for that, but he did confess to that crime at a later date. He saw females as something to be controlled, used and manipulated. He's likely to have seen them as objects rather than people. Huntley's motive for killing the girls is unknown. However, minutes before seeing the girls, he'd reportedly put the phone down on Maxine Carr following quite a furious argument. Huntley had allegedly sus uh, suspected that Maxine was cheating on him and that led to both Huntley's mother and the police to suspect that Huntley had killed the two girls in a fit of jealous rage. Ian Huntley's first wife confirms how controlling and aggressive he was with her during their relationship. A neighbour who was a friend with Maxine also confirmed that Ian was very controlling and he wouldn't allow her to have visitors in the house. She also witnessed Ian Huntley hitting her and lashing out at her on a number of occasions. Ian Huntley is clearly a narcissistic, manipulating man. He seeks out young or otherwise vulnerable women. And by doing this, he's looking for the type of females that he could more easily control and manipulate. Probably the most disturbing aspect to his personality is the way in which he could outwardly portray a calm and quiet man who's fairly withdrawn and quite gentle. Ian Huntley is always looking for ways in which he can evade punishment or detection he initially denied any involvement in the girl's disappearance. However, once there was undeniable evidence of his involvement, he attempted to feign the mental illness. Once this failed, he then began to deny any involvement in the girl's disappearance. However, because of the undeniable forensic evidence, he later changed his story to suggest that they, the girls had died accidentally at his home. Huntley admitted to his part in the murders and told the court that he'd returned to the site a few days after the girls had died and he'd set their bodies alight. He was attempting to destroy any forensic evidence. This is likely to not be the only reason that he returned to the bodies. As I mentioned previously, he'd kept clothes as trophies and they were probably to relive the event. Murderers will often return to their bodies of their victims to take another look at their handiwork. Their bodies were far enough away from his home, but they were close enough so that he could go back to that location. Ian Huntley had even volunteered to search for the bodies of the young girls. And again, this isn't unusual for many murderers. Some arsonists and murderers will take an active interest in the investigation and searches that follow the crime. And this just shows Ian Huntley's level of arrogance, his belief that he wouldn't get caught. He's likely to think that he's much better than everybody else and he probably thought that he was way too clever to be caught. You may be wondering how somebody with such an extensive criminal background was allowed to work as a caretaker in a school. The school, unfortunately, hadn't checked the references that he'd provided. 
He'd applied for the job as Ian Nixon, although he did state on the application form that he'd previously been known as Ian Huntley. However, the name, name Ian Huntley wasn't searched and therefore his previous offences only came to be known after he, was, he had killed and was arrested. Ian Huntley was sentenced to life imprisonment. Once he was in prison, he was scalded by, with boiling water by another prisoner. He did try and claim compensation for that, but that failed. Ian Huntley was attacked in prison for a second time, and this time the prisoner attempted to cut his throat. He didn't die from this, he just suffered severe injuries, was treated and survived. Huntley also tried to commit suicide by overdosing on antidepressants, but that also failed. His cell was searched as a result of this and he was taking the tablets illegally. When they searched his cell, they found a tape which had Queen written on one side and Meatloaf written on the other. And this tape was a confession by Hindley, which he recorded and gave to another prisoner as payment for the antidepressants. This prisoner had intended to sell the taped confession to a newspaper and the newspaper began printing the transcripts of this in 2007. And this is where I tend to fall out of, of favour with the, the media a little bit. Putting transcripts of how he killed the two young girls was solely an attempt to sensationalise the attacks and to sell newspapers. Can you imagine being a family member of one of those girls and having to read what some monster did to them? All in the name of money money that the prisoner might have received from selling the tapes, as well as money for the sales of the newspaper. I personally didn't read these transcripts, and this was partly because I could empathise with the families of the victim of the horror of these transcripts being made public. And it was also partly because they were printed in an unscrupulous tabloid that nobody on Merseyside reads anymore. It's not uncommon for some prison inmates to attack others for the crimes that they've committed. Some prisoners see crimes against women and children as abhorrent and they'll target those who've been convicted of crimes such as these. They see their own crimes as being not as bad and the person that they're, they're targeting has committed some really foul act and therefore they're targeted in a violent way. And in this way, they're kind of saying, I know I did a crime, but yours was much worse than mine. In fact, the person who cut Ian Huntley's throat also went on to, to kill another child killer who was behind bars. That prisoner pleaded guilty to both attacks. In conclusion, then, Ian Huntley was a controlling, manipulative narcissist who portrayed himself as a quiet, unassuming and gentle man. Because he didn't have a threatening persona, he was able to trick and convince people that he was quite harmless. However, behind closed doors, he was extremely violent and controlling. He clearly had a very unhealthy sexual interest in young females. Failings on behalf of several organisations meant that he held a position that he should never been allowed to hold. Thank you so much for taking this time to watch the video. I do hope that you found it interesting. Bye for now.